Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So it's a pleasure to welcome Roger Gross and Will Har Harwood, who will be talking uh, uh, today about the Turing Trap. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Hi, afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me all okay? Great, thank you. Um, I'll just start by kind of declaring my, my interest. I've been involved in microcomputers and operating systems all my career, so I'm not here to bash them. Um, I worked at Digital Research, which was Microsoft's arch enemy back in the uh, 80s and 90s. So I came up through the kind of CPM, single tasking, multitasking, multi user operating systems. Worked on GEM, the failed attempt to take over the world of Windows, and all those things. So um, I, I mention this because I'm approaching this from a s somewhat a position of knowledge about the the reasons why operating systems and PCs are how they are. So I'm not here to bash them. I'm kind of here to offer an alternative that perhaps what I'm going to argue is that perhaps the PC is sometimes overkill for what's needed. That's really what I'm getting at. So if you're hoping that I was going to have a go at operating systems, you'll be a little bit disappointed, I'm afraid. Um, what else, actually, what I will say, so my colleague, um, Dr. Will Harwood, is here as well. What we'll do, we'll kind of take questions at the end. If, Interject if I'm not making sense and it's a point of clarity, please interject. But um, if you can save your question to the end, then, then please do. So um, just a little bit about us. Um, Will and I started this company, gosh, two years ago now um, on the basis that uh, we, we met up. We knew each other from Citrix. We got together and uh, Will had this idea that he had a, a way of solving the, the problem of um, usernames and passwords, which were starting to get a lot of traction in the media about uh, the thefts of these things. So he proposed a, a solution, which he was originally going to do as an academic project. And I said, hang on, I think there might be a chance to make some money out of this if we can get it right. So sadly, the jury's still out on that. We've uh, started a business, but we're not profitable yet. But um, that's where we came from. So being a small company, the only way we can compete with you big guys is we have to file patents. So I don't want to get into the arguments about patents, but they're pretty useful for us as small companies. So, we filed a patent in the UK and the US on our technology. Um, and we're currently just entering beta. We've built a product, bought along the, uh, our hardware board here. It's real. Um, and uh, we're, we're just entering beta, and we hope to have a product towards the end of this year, which we can actually sell. So what we do, um, we're in the business of offering impenetrable hardware solutions. And I'll explain why we believe we've made our solution impenetrable. And we're particularly looking at cyber attacks on businesses. So we're not trying to solve all theft from the internet, but what we're particularly trying to do is protect the business from the problem of data theft because the business is somebody that you can sue, somebody that you can have a go at. So if the business can get rid of that problem, then we'll consider it to be job done, even though we might inadvertently push that problem somewhere else. Um, now, we're initially focusing on usernames and passwords at rest, but we believe that our architecture, as I'll show you, is applicable to other forms of other referenceable data, so biometrics, credit cards, secure databases, that kind of thing. So um, I won't dwell on this slide, but you, you, you'll be aware of the problem. Here are just some of the, the big data thefts that have hit the headlines. The thing about these ones is that they were stolen from backing store, i.e. the data center of the business. And that's our focus is um, the fact that this was stolen from the business, it means that the business has to do something about it. So we're not overly concerned with data theft from clients. That's a problem that needs solving, but we're particularly fo focusing on trying to solve the problem of, of theft from the business. Some pretty huge ones here. eBay was a very interesting one, of course, because that was a social engineering attack. They obtained the administrator credentials and let themselves in, obtained the decryption keys, took everything. Very interesting one, that one. Uh, we would maintain that our solution would have prevented that theft. Okay, so um, why do passwords get stolen from backing store particularly? Well, if we look at uh, an attempt to steal a million passwords, there are various places you can steal them. I'll go through this quickly because you'll know all this stuff, but I don't think you'd disagree that it potentially, if you can't get access to the encryption keys, then you're looking at years potentially to steal uh, data in transit. It's, it's not worth bothering about. There are easier ways of doing it we would argue. 
Um, certainly it's worth having a go at stealing credentials from the client, phishing attacks, all sorts of various methods can be used there. But you're probably looking at days and potentially you've got to infect a million clients to steal a million passwords. Again, there are easier ways of doing that. If you can manage to penetrate the data center, then great. You can uh, hijack the web server. You can memory scrape the credentials as they go through. I mean, that's effectively what the target scam was, where they were um, scraping credit card details obviously from the terminals. But that was the type of approach they took there. And then if you can get access to the database, well, you know, even with, a, with an eight megabit uplink, you're kind of gone in 60 seconds, really. You can take a million passwords could be uploaded in that time. So this is partly why this is a, a favorite. If you can get into that location, you can just steal vast numbers of credentials in one go. So a quick look at <clears throat> the cost of the problem, because we're focusing on the effects of, for the business. Uh, some, some of these figures are quite astonishing. I really didn't honestly believe these when we first heard them. But there's lots of different sources that um, confirm this, that we're looking at you know, $160-odd per record stolen when you average this out, and $5.4 million per incident. I saw a, um, a report a while back from the British Chamber of Commerce that said that most small and medium-sized businesses that actually have a data theft, have a breach, they simply don't recover. They go bust within 12 months. Just the cost of the forensic team. Um, and in the US, of course, you've got the whole class action litigation thing to go through, which is not quite as bad as it is here. But um, if it happens to you, um, then it, it's pretty serious. So we use halt uh, hashing, sorting, and encryption. These are all good things. We don't suggest you don't do that. But we would argue that that doesn't prevent the theft. Even, even the theft of encrypted data can trigger the, the uh, process of having to fess up to the authorities, and it can begin that really expensive um, process that goes associated with remediation. So we believe the best thing to do is to prevent the theft of it in the first place, not just encrypt it and hope that nobody can decrypt it. So hence to the Turing trap, we see the cause of this problem is the universal computer, because it can do anything, we tend to use it for everything. I mean, why not? The economies of scale that you get from a common solution to common problems is great, but of course with that also goes common vulnerabilities across all the solutions that use it. So if we look at why the universal computer can be hacked, certainly the, the features of it, it has the volume and architecture. The, the PC wouldn't work if it didn't. It needs to load multiple programs. But of course, as you load programs, you could load malware. So there's not a lot you can get away from that problem. There are attempts, and there's all sorts of things where you can set code as execute only. But if you start with something that's insecure and you make it secure, the malware's just got to make it unsecure again. If you can close a door, if, if a door can be opened, then once you've closed it, it will be opened again. Um, permissions, well, if you allow administrator special access all areas, then again, if you have some successful privilege escalation attack, then um, the malware is going to find a way to do that and they're going to obtain the same privileges. So a solution to this problem needs to prevent even the administrator from gaining access to the data. And also we believe that the, the platform itself is just so huge. Now, like I say, my background's in operating systems. I understand the reasons why they've bloated. Uh, I won't go into all the reasons. I have opinions on to why they have, but they just have. Um, but if you don't, do you really need a full-blown operating system on a PC and a full-blown database just to compare a couple of password strings? You know, that's the question that we're saying. Surely this could be put into a much simpler appliance that just performs a specific function of authentication. It doesn't need to be quite so complex because lurking in there are all these exploits and, and problems that have been there for years. I mean, um, you know, 15 years ago, some of these exploits are in the code. So our solution that we propose, and we've built one, as I showed you earlier, is, um, is dedicated hardware. And we coined this phrase, no read hardware. So um, it's an impen impenetrable appliance using hardware protection. Um, from an operating system, from, from an operational standpoint, it's very simple. Instead of um, going to a database to authenticate your credentials, you just call the appliance. You send it the username and password, and it just replies yes or no. So it can only ever reply with yes or no or an error code. It just basically gives an 8-bit response. You can send lots of data into it, but it'll only ever talk to you back with a byte of data. So we have a proprietary protocol called SNAP, which would be used. So the good news is the website itself doesn't really change visually. 
but your let's call it your login.php that goes off and decides whether you'll let this person in or not, that will query the database. That's the place where you'll make your code change, and it will call the appliance instead, and it will simply get a yes or a no reply. So our protection strategies here that we've employed, so the first thing is this term no read. So passwords can be stored and verified, but never retrieved. Now we're confident about this because the solution was quite simple. We've literally omitted to implement any logic that allows you to read the data off. So there is no functional method, no logical method of reading data off this device. We've created effectively a non-return valve, a, a data diode that allows data to go in one direction but only allows eight bits of data to go back the other way. And that is in force. That's not something that we don't start with an open system and we've protected it because that could be undone. We've started with a system that simply cannot, not even the administrator can force this box to give out more than eight bits of data. So that's pretty good. Also, uh, the fact that this box, as I call it, just authenticates passwords, um, it doesn't need to load other programs. So we don't need to use a regular microprocessor. What we use are microcontrollers that are Harvard processors. Just to remind you, the Harvard processors have separate address buses for program memory and data memory. So even if you manage to inject code into data memory, the processor doesn't know what to do with it. It simply physically cannot execute it. So we wipe out the malware issue. Now that's a biggie actually because if I were hacking this box I would use malware as a way of implementing a read interface even if we didn't put one in. But the fact that you can't inject this thing with malware gets around that particular problem. And finally well it's not a PC and it's not an OS so of course at a stroke all of the thousands of exploits and vulnerabilities are out there are wiped clean. Yes okay people will attack this, hackers will attack this box and try to find other ones. But by having this smaller attack surface, we're making it much, much harder. And to give an example here, we're, we're about 40 kilobytes, not, not megabytes, that's not a spelling mistake, 40 kilobytes of compiled code, um, of C++ code, which we use on these microcontrollers. And most of that code is actually to do with marshalling data between the processors. It doesn't do much actual functionality. So, um, <clears throat> so if we don't let data off this device, how the heck do you back it up? Well, that is, a, is an issue. So what we do is we, uh, we replicate to um, redundant appliances. So when a, what we call a write command, which is a command to either create a credential or to modify a credential to, to change a password, it effectively gets sent to two places. It gets sent to the storage device where it's stored and updated, but it also gets mirrored over a completely separate interface, a private network to mirror devices so that in the event of um, a failure of one device, of course, you immediately get redundancy, failover, load balancing, all those wonderful things kind of come for free once you go the mirroring route. But primarily, we decided to go mirroring because we thought, well, if it's a no-read device, it's a no-read device. You, know, you can't get the data off it over, over the network connection to it. So a quick look at the architecture. Um, so what we have here is um, we've got three microcontrollers. It's a, a system of three call them CPUs they're actually microcontrollers the difference being they've got their own memory uh, ROM and, and RAM in them so we, we have this notion of the outside world which is most likely still inside your data center this is where the web server talks to the box this is where these snap commands come in which um, set and change credentials and, and do authentication so we've got a separate processor that is dedicated to taking that traffic decrypting it and doing some basic checks on the um, packets before forwarding it on to another processor. But the main thing here is that we've separated this out. There's no shared memory on this thing. There's no DMA. Okay, you can't do a, a buffer overflow attack on the TCP IP stack and expect to um, infiltrate some other part of memory. Can't happen. We've got TCP IP on a chip. It's on a, another microcontroller, which is also a Harvard processor. Uh, and we communicate with that over a serial a very high-speed serial connection. So we're in control how much data we read. You can't push data into the processor. That's quite important. And each of these um, microcontrollers, uh, there's no shared memory between them. They all communicate with each other over a high-speed serial. So you can't inadvertently, even if you could infect a Harvard processor in some way, it, you, you couldn't cause that problem to spill out to another processor. On the other side of the picture here, we have the private network. And this is a completely separate interface that we use for mirroring 
and config. So if you want to configure the box, so when you first configure this box, you'll want to put your um, encryption keys on, you'll want to set the administrator password, that kind of thing. Um, that's all done on the private network, and you can't use those commands on the, on the outside world network. That's not possible. So typically, your store and verify fun commands come in. So it'll say, create an account. That will come in through the outside world processor. It will be decrypted. It'll be sent across to the central, the, to the CPU2 there. And that will get put into the store. And then it will reply back with a, yes, I did it, or no, I couldn't do it, that kind of thing. Now, simultaneously, what's happening is that uh, you, if it's a change request, you forward it onto another mirror. And of course, there could be stuff happening on the mirror device that needs to come back the other way. So this CPU3 is quite a busy thing that's sitting there um, forwarding and receiving changes. Okay, so that, that's fundamentally the architecture that, that we employ. As far as system integration goes, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. You just replace the, the piece of code where you would normally go off to your database or your password file even to look up the credentials. That's the bit that changes. You'll, um, you'll obtain the username and password guess from the user. You package it up. It's basically a, a TCP request. You send it across to the box. Uh, it's got a, a secure wrapper around it, obviously. Uh, you send it across to the box, and it will reply yes or no. But it's very simple integration. The first integration that was done was um, we're part of BT, uh, BT Martlesham's incubator, which is over in Ipswich. And uh, they have a, a customer showcase there. and they. Without a manual and without anything, he'd, within a couple of hours, he'd got a, an implementation going just from a description that we, we gave him over the phone. Uh, and he, uh, he managed to get it talking to the box. So it genuinely is very, very simple to do this integration. You're not looking. Yeah, go on. Do you have any way of resetting the password? Any way of? Resetting the password? Resetting. I'm, yes. a, you know, I'm a lousy user. I forgot my password. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, if you know your password, you can change it. If you forget it, we have the notion of, um, an administrator mode where if, if you click on your link to say I've forgotten my password, there is a command that could be sent to the box to say reset the password. So you can never find out what the password was, but you can force a temporary password which the user can then reset. So yes, there is a way of doing that. Quick comment, um, reset only. Yes, yes. and once, you, once, you've, once we have reset a user's password, it has to be reset the next time you log in. So um, it goes into a reset mode. Whether the first time before you can use that password again, it has to be reset to something else. Okay, but yes, you can do that. Yeah. So nobody really does this, right? I mean, if you go right back to the original Unix password file, it was done by having salt doing the encryption and checking the encrypted result, right? So nobody actually stores passwords. So how is that? You know, all that you've done is move the encryption and test function into a separate piece of hardware. It's not clear that from a whole system point of view, you've changed any of the threat analysis, right? Yeah, do you want to answer that one more? Hopefully that now works. Sorry, um, who asked the question? Hi. Um, yeah, um, Unix passwords, um, or any system passwords. Um, Yes, in um, Unix, you store pass, um, you inc hash or encrypt uh, passwords, and you, comp and you compare the um, the hash. The unfortunate thing is that um, you can, in Unix or most other systems, you can steal that hash table. Now, if you um, steal the hash table, then you can start computing potential um, matches to the hash table. Yes, now that's true only because the the uh, you know so t the one way function that was originally chosen is now incredibly weak by the standards of modern computation right it's not indeed. it's not something fundamental well the the argument here is actually straightforward but I'm not disagreeing with you by the way it's sort of um, the argument though is straightforward which amounts to um, if you're a business and you have that table stolen that is a data leak event Right? The change here is we're saying, no, what we're trying to do is prevent that table from being stolen. So if you're a business and you have that table stolen, depending what kind of business you are, you have to notify the appropriate authorities and they will tell you whether or not you will have to notify your customers. 
Unfortunately, a number of people have actually had the table stolen and be told they don't have to notify their customers and then actually it's leaked out anyway and, they and their business has been damaged as a consequence. Right. So, if you believe that cryptography is a secure enough solution, which actually I do, put my hands up, I believe cryptography works, but if you're a business, you still have a problem. And what we're trying to do is cure that problem. As a side effect of curing that problem, um, well, no, I'll, I'll stay there because somebody asking a question behind you. If this is going to go into a long discussion, can we take it at the end and let Roger finish? Because I'd... Just a slight thing is, your, your basic argument is that the operating system is weak because of change and modification at large. But what you're now asking us to sort of say is, we have to trust your software is secure, and we also have to trust your software is reliable. Yes. And because you're mirroring, if you corrupt one, you corrupt both, <coughs> and therefore you've killed all your passwords. Absolutely. So, so why, should, why should we why trust Why should you? you trust us, and why should we trust you? Good question. Now, what we're talking about here is a very small amount of code compared to an operating system. Therefore, we'd be, you know, two things. One, to our customers, at least, um, to our customers and people under non-disclosure, we are willing to publish that code provide it to them for the same. Two, as part, if this were an academic project whose funding cycle is different from a commercial one, we would have started by, take, by developing this small amount of code as verified code. Unfortunately, the nature of commercial projects is you have to add demonstrators before you get the money that you can put into developing, um, to doing things like developing verified code. So our intention is that this small amount of code will in fact be verified code. Now, if you say you don't trust the verified code, that's another matter altogether and a different discussion we can have. But verified code doesn't prove it's reliable. Pardon? Oh, no, it doesn't prove it's reliable. You can still get corruptions and then... And yeah, then well, we have to... Yeah, I mean, how do you prove your operating system is reliable? Yeah, but you, you, no, you, I'm asking you, a question. You, how do you prove an operating you're, you're system is reliable? You're giving an alternative and you're not proving the alternative is better than the current. I currently have an operating system, but you're yeah. giving me an alternative to the operating system, basically saying it's more reliable and more secure, but there's no proof it's more reliable and more secure. It's there's smaller. No That's all it is. Okay. I'll, I'll agree yeah. that there's no proof at the moment that it is more reliable. There's no proof even that it... Let, let's be fair about this. Let's be honest about it. There's no proof it is as reliable. Um, should a proof, such a proof be forthcoming? you would accept it. If I could prove it's as reliable as your current operating system, you'd accept it. That's what you're saying, isn't it? No, I'm saying, why should I change? So you're saying, if I could prove it's more reliable than your current operating system, you'd accept it? Um, no, you'd have to prove it was, because you're mirroring, you'd have to prove it was totally reliable. Because I'm mirroring, I have to be able to prove Sorry, I think I'm missing your point here. Are you saying it's not possible to produce any mirroring system that actually is reliable? Without you, the problem you've got is the fact is that if, if you corrupt the database, yeah. you've lost all your accounts. Because our mirroring changes, if I corrupt, if I corrupt one, I corrupt the other. Yes. Um, and your solution... Sorry, I don't, uh, and I will talk to you afterwards about this because I'm a little bit confused now, because I don't see how that isn't the same problem you have with an operating system that if I, correct the, if I corrupt the data, that the data is corrupted, whether or not I'm mirroring. Take off line. Okay, we'll come back to this. I think, um, just going back to my earlier point, the thing we're trying to do really here is that uh, we, we are just trying to reassure the, the business that, the, that they can avoid a data theft event. That's the main, if we look at the cost, going back to those costs of having a data theft, that's the absolutely crippling cost to a business. Your business is almost guaranteed to go out of business if you have one of those events. That's actually the things that, you know, we've obviously talked to quite a lot of data center managers and, and potential customers of this product. And that's the thing that's keeping them awake at night and, and, and the thought of losing their jobs is a data theft. So. Yes, in, in a sense, it, it's a bit like going back 20 years when cars were stolen. They, they put immobilizers in and 
stop cars being stolen, but actually really what happened was the thieves just broke into people's houses and stole the keys. So the car still got stolen, but the car manufacturers could say, yeah, but you know, they used the key. It wasn't that our car wasn't secure. So we're kind of <coughs> going down that same road, I suppose. What we're trying to do is that the business can turn around and say, look, well, you know, the, the data wasn't stolen from me. They, they stole it from the client. That's actually not my problem, I'm sorry. So it doesn't solve the whole problem of data theft. But we're just trying to, we're taking a, a, a ruthless approach to this, which is um, if we're going to make any money out of this, the people that are likely to pay for the solution are going to be businesses. And the businesses, if they can avoid that catastrophic incident of a data breach, then um, they'll be willing to pay money for it. And our job really is to convince them that it's less likely for that data to be stolen. And things like the bit that they always pick up on when I do these pitches is this Harvard architecture and the no-read bit. Um, they look at it and... Uh, they say, well, yeah, I can see how that would work. And that's kind of, they're happier that it's likely to be a better solution than what they've got now. Well, how you prove that is a very good question. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll move on here. So um, I, I've talked about these snap commands. Th these are the, this is just an example of some of the, the commands that would come in over the public interface. Uh, so we got a very simple ping just to say, hello, are you there? And then it's uh, ASCII commands. It's pling, 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 and then C to compare. So that's your, your authenticate command is simply <coughs> compare the username with the password. Does it match, yes or no? We've got a write. You can see we've got an update. Then we've got a bunch of what we call these admin type commands, which are uh, for housekeeping. This is uh, going back to the question about how do you reset the password if you've forgotten it. Now, there's a whole separate set of commands which come in over the private interface which are used to configure the box to set the encryption keys etc. I haven't shown those. But these are the typical commands that the web server would use to talk to the box. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about FIDO here. Um, so FIDO is this uh, fast identity online. Um, obviously Microsoft are a, a member, Google, some of the credit card companies. Um, the couple of standards that have been proposed here. So FIDO UTF is really a way of um, using existing usernames and passwords, but supplementing it with some kind of physical device. And this will be implemented through kind of web browser extension. So we think FIDO U2F, great idea. We don't have a problem with that because you're still gonna have to store your username and password somewhere. So that doesn't um, cause us a problem. In fact, this is actually a particularly good solution because from the, you know, it ma makes the authentication much more secure and we can provide the business with a secure way of storing the usernames and passwords. So, so we like that. Um, FIDO UAF, this is an interesting one. This is kind of billed as, you know, the death of the password. Well, in reality, we don't see that being the case at all because certainly it makes it easier for the user. They don't have to use a username and password to authenticate anymore. But you do have this bootstrap problem that, you know, you, you can't add a device and you can't use a device to add a device you haven't added yet. So you're always going to have to have a username and password to log in. Then you go to a, a registration process where you add your device. And from then on, that's fantastic because you can use that device to authenticate. But on the occasion where you lose that device, you're going to have to go in and revoke the old device, add a new one. So you've got to have a way of logging in. Now, I know um, FIDO UF suggests that you have two devices, but I, I, before I did this business, I used to run an online training company. And one of the problems we had was, you know, support. And I can tell you, I would never be put in a situation where a user could phone me up at three o'clock in the morning saying I've lost my device, you know, I can't get into my website. You're always going to have to provide a, a way of getting in, which means that it's going to have to be the username and password. But the username and password won't be used regularly. It'll just be something that you would use to access your account to do the registration revocation. And of course, there'll be legacy devices around there for a while that'll still need to be used. So we think it's a bit disingenuous to say that passwords disappear with UAF. We believe that the nature of them changes, that they, they just become a kind of a, 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 an account management event as opposed to something that you use multiple times a day to get into your devices. So again, we would argue <laughs> when we go in to see our customers, we say, Fido, UAF, great idea, but you're still going to have to protect those account management passwords, um, which you aren't used as much, but they've still got to be protected. And if they're stolen, that triggers the whole event of disclosure, and you're right back to square one with your potential $160 um, dollar per incident cost. So FIDO, we're okay with FIDO actually. <coughs> um, then you've got your, your more traditional multi-factor authentication, which is what we refer to as the kind of more centralized storage model. 
This is, th there's a whole variety of these solutions out there. Some of them literally store the thumbprint centrally. More often, they'll do some kind of template analysis on the thumbprint and then send effectively a template to the device to, um, to be stored. So again, we, it's just another password. It's just not a text one. And obviously, the verification algorithm is different. It's not a simple compare. It's, it's more complicated. But um, we see on our roadmap, fine. You want to use biometrics, that's great. They've got to be stored somewhere. And again, you, you might argue, well, what can they do with a, with a thumbprint if they steal it? Well, it, it's data theft. Data has been stolen from a business. They've got to disclose it. So any data. Public keys. I mean, well, I'll go back to FIDO. FIDO stores you know, public keys. What use is a public key if you haven't got the private key? But if a public key gets stolen, there's still an argument that it's data that's been stolen from a business. It seems really harsh from the business's point of view. They will argue strongly, but what can you do with this data? They'll say, yeah, but you've had a data breach. So you have to go through the whole process. And this is really what's really worrying them. And this is the thing that we've latched onto, is that this is one of those unfair problems from a business's point of view. So the business has simply got to try and stamp out this theft. Because if they can't, they might unfairly be liable for having to disclose the, th the theft of something that you could argue, well, what can I do with it? So obviously, we're making some quite major claims. How do we prove this? Well, one of the things we've done, this isn't proof as such, but it's, um, we've got a hacker challenge. And because when we talk to businesses, they say, well, you know, what are your proof points? Well, we're only just going into beta now. By the end of the summer, we hope to have some businesses that will have said, yeah, we've used the system. It appears to work. It performs well. We haven't, you know, we believe it's secure. But we decided let's have a hacker challenge. So this is a bit of fun. It's a chance to get a bit of publicity too for us. Uh, and every time um, you know the North Koreans go out and do something, we try and hijack that, and we we offer some prize of you know 10 million North Korean currency, which it turns out to be about 750 pounds because of the exchange rate. But it sounds good, and it gets us a bit of press coverage. Press coverage. We have to do these things. But we've had a couple of thousand um, uh, visitors and, and a one and a quarter million hacks. So. This is just something that's ongoing. I know you will say this is not serious proof, but it, it, it's a proof point of sorts. So um, here's a kind of a roadmap. I'm mentioning this just to say, really, that even if you think passwords are kind of history and that they're going to disappear, we see that this, this no-read concept, this idea of having hardware limitation to data that can come off a device, we think that this thing has legs and that it can be applied to other things. Biometrics, I've mentioned, FIDO. Credit cards is an interesting one. Um, obviously, the credit card data has to leave at some point to go to the clearing bank so they know the transactions occurred. But a variation on, on a no-read server is a selective read server so that you can send data into the device and the transaction can be reported to the clearing bank through a completely separate interface so that you can't come back in from the public interface and try and pull that data out because the hardware physically restricts you. Um, but you could have a separate interface that talks to the clearing bank to send them the transaction details. And then we've got some ideas about database protect, the idea of a, um, a secure NoSQL database where you can have selective reads and selective um, sending of data. And we're, t we're in talks with Channel 4 about that particular idea. Um, they're quite interested in that. So um, just a summary. So we believe that you know software on PCs if it's not a Harvard architecture, if it's prone to malware, what can you do? It's nobody's fault. You can have the most secure application if you want. You can have a very, very secure operating system if you want. But at the end of the day, the processor is what it is. So there's always going to be ways of, of, of attacking it. We believe if you can actually have no-read hardware, where the hardware itself just will not let that data come back out, and with all the, the, you know, if we can prove that that non-return valve is functioning, then this has got to be um, something surely worth looking at. Um, and back to this point that solving the root cause of the problem, the data theft, is the key thing here. Because if, even if encrypted data is stolen, that more often than not triggers this uh, event where you have to report and fess up to the authorities. So we think that's a, a problem that's worth solving. OK, thank you. So if there's any more questions? Go ahead. Uh, one question. So you're saying that uh, one of the problems for businesses is that uh, they can be unfairly judged in case of data theft. But uh, isn't uh, a set of a single answer, yes, no, to one of the questions, will be considered a set as well? So isn't it the same case? 
What you, you, you do you mean the fact that, um, that you can learn yeah, something about the like millions of uh, question answer pairs? Yeah. Uh, if you get a connect to your server, um, isn't this going to be the same problem for business? I, I, I see the point you're making. Yes, but um, th what 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 they're concerned about is the if you can show a tangible piece of data that's been stolen from storage is the thing that triggers the event. I think yes, obviously the point you're making that that you if you you learn something about the integrity of that database simply by asking the question. No, it's not that password right now. I know something about that. But yes, that is a that's true. But what the what we're talking about here really is that some data has physically been stolen, actual data that was taken from a user and, and stored rather than the leaking of, of data that could reveal the contents. Basically, so that, it's the, the ability it's... to link a piece of data to a, particular, to a particular identity. So if I can link, if you're in the States, if I, um, if I get your social security number, that's a data leak. Um, if I get... Um, if I can link it to your identity. A big list of social security numbers is obviously not useful. If I can link it to your identity, it is useful. And that's the general criteria that actually gets used. Can I link it to an identity? Querying the box. Now, this is a reasonable question. You know, There are you know, a billion possible passwords, and I've just tried one. I know it's not that. I know this user is not that password. Most organizations will say you don't have something that's particularly that's linkable to an identity, fortunately. It is an issue, though, for formal proof. Oh, yes. yes. We understand um, that. <laughs> I will say on the matter of formal proof, um, the notion of what constitutes a proof in the, con in the situation where you're dealing with passwords, of get because it's exactly, you cannot, the, the case you're doing, you, you always get some information. So if you take sort of standard models of um, things like non-interference, then they don't work because non-interference says you get no information. Testing a password, you get some information. So you've got to formulate the proof slightly differently. Sorry. Yeah, good. I mean, it's clear that building this kind of hardware protection around the password database is one way of raising a particular kind of bar against particular kinds of attacks. I think you need to be careful when you present it that you don't kind of over-egg it. And there's a number of ways in which uh, you know, I just get concerned about the way you're presenting this. So one is, since the invention of return-oriented programming, the hardware ar architecture does not help you, okay? Because the attacker does not need to inject code to take control of the machine. That's true. So you shouldn't, so all of your, you should be extremely clear, because the way, a lot of what you said today gives the impression, especially to a non-technical, if you were presenting this to a business audience rather than technical audience, gives the impression that hardware architecture would magically solve the problem of uh, attackers taking control of a machine, which they do not. Um, secondly, in a real environment, you have to, you, you know, as you pointed out, you have to replicate these devices in case of failure. The replication has got to be geo-distributed for any real serious customer. And that means that your private interface actually has to be on top of a VLAN provided by the data center operator, including wide area links provided by some other operator. And that's another whole issue of, uh, you know, you've kind of described it, yes, I mean, obviously, again, this defense in depth there, again, that's clearly not the intended network on which attacker traffic would be, but it's clear that it's not just simply a point, you know, a, a crossover cable between two boxes, right, that are on the shelf. Um, and then finally, there's the whole question of, well, the point of having the password is that it protects something. And um, what you've done, perhaps, is raise the bar around uh, the the password, but it's not clear if you look at the the whole from a whole system point of view. It's not clear that you've made the system any stronger. Um, the, the, somewhere there's a piece of code that's asking your box questions and getting <coughs> answers, and either that link between the, that component and your box is subject to attack or subject to uh, being spied on, or the piece of code that's asking the questions can be tricked to ask the wrong questions, or the actual piece of code that it's asking the questions can be tricked to not ask the questions. And so from a larger whole system point of view, you know, you're protecting, if, if to use your uh, car stealing analogy, uh, you know, you're, you're protecting the bit around the, the lock in the car, you're not protecting the whole car. Okay, well to respond to that last point first, and when we're talking to business customers, we're normally quite clear about this. 
and I don't think we've been quite clear about this. The objective of what we're doing is the prevention of bulk password theft from backing store. Right, that is the song. We're not making claims beyond that. No, because, and the reason for doing that, it is because it's a real issue for businesses today. Jumping now to your first thing about return-oriented programming, um, good thing to raise. Um, two things um, about that. Being aware of return-oriented programming, as a possibility, you can attempt to minimise the opportunities for that actually taking place. And part of that is actually having a minimum code surface and, and minimising the number um, and let's say, being very careful how you actually carry out the coding and the way that you actually use um, um, procedure calls in the languages, the way that you're actually using the stack. Right? And that is something that we actually have been concerned about, although don't normally talk about. Um, the second thing about return-oriented programming, um, just as a thought. Um, studies, the last studies I read on this... Um, about how much you need to get universal, um, to get a universal machine out of you, how much code ought to be in the system before you can get a, expect to get a universal machine equivalent um, by return engine programming, is, um, was, just, um, was you're usually looking around for a system which is um, around a, uh, let's see, about C a million, about a no, million lines. Standard C runtime is enough. A standard C runtime. Your standard C runtime is enough. If, you, if you're programming in C, there's enough in your runtime for the Rob gadget. That's the current state of the art. Oh right. Well, I. We. I mean, I don't think there's anything. Well, well, I'm, I'm not problem. saying that you should solve the Rob problem. No, no, I'm no, no, saying no, no. I think I'm... when you present this, it's no, clear no, no, that Harvard yes. architecture raises the bar. Yes. It's excellent that it does. It's in the same way that Intel's data execution prevention and a number of other similar techniques attempt on a more traditional architecture to likewise raise the bar to a similar level. Sorry, can you I should you, not avoid... Yeah, can, I, can I ask a question? Because this is worth following up for me. Sure. Um, the standard C runtime is enough, yes? Are we talking about the standard C, um, the, a standard C runtime on a bare metal machine or a standard C runtime running on top of an OS? Bare metal machine. Bare metal, metal machine, machine. okay. But we, Can we, I have a reference? Uh, no, but, but um, uh, Manuel might be able to give you a reference because okay. it's more his field than mine. <laughs> the, the, the thing I would say is we've, we, there is no logic on there which caters for the fact that the data can come off the way that it went in. So it's not a case of tricking the box into executing that routine that, that would activate that in lieu of the administrator doing it. There is no... You know, no mechanism that we've put in there to allow that no, data but to come back what out. What basically is talking about is this um, return oriented programming. Yeah, the C Is time. where you basically trick the stack. Yes. Um, oh, yes. So you're using code which is already the, um, so you're using code that's already there. So you're quite right that we don't actually have that. The question is whether there are enough fragments that you can trick the stack so that you can build up whatever program you like. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we. But in practice, I, I don't think. You know, if I was attacking this from a whole system point of view, the attacker will always go for the weakest link. Oh, indeed. And what, what you've done clearly is, you, you know, put a very uh, detailed protection, point protection around the password database, which is fine. But the attack it just means the attacker is going to look somewhere else in the overall system. Oh, we accept that um, as um, the depressing thing about sort of solving any particular problem is it just means that the problem moves elsewhere. Yes, it is the squeezing the balloon. And, but as long as when we squeeze that balloon, the problem goes outside the data center, preferably, where it goes away from the business's liability is what we're attempting to achieve here. And um, I mean, coming back to the, you know, yes, you could, if you threw enough processing power at it, you could put your attentions on actually um, cracking encrypted traffic, but there's just easy ways of doing it. So we're just trying to raise this bar to make it so much harder that the hackers will just go somewhere else. And that's really what the businesses are trying to do. They're looking at the headlines, they're getting their CEO is saying to them, you know, I've just read this hack this morning in, in the register. Is this going to be a problem for us? Um, and so if we're, we're, we're trying to, we're preying on their anxieties and trying to say, well, look, you do this, it'll be more secure. And, and I think um, certainly we have come across um, people when we've spoken to businesses that, that are overwhelmed by this and they just say, look, if I can't solve the problem, it's not worth it. 
And well, you could take that approach, but we, we would then counter-argue, well, that's a bit defeatist. We would say, look, if you can make it more secure and you move the problem somewhere else, then you've improved that. I think if you, um, it would be very difficult to say to your users that I didn't implement something that would have made it more secure just because the problem's too big to solve. I think you have got that governance issue, which the kind of CEOs and chairmen kind of worry about. And a lot of the, uh, some of the inquiries that we've had have come top down, not, not bottom up from the techies looking at this saying, yeah, actually this would be useful. It has come from concerned chairmen and CEOs that are just reading these stories and panicking a bit. And we're saying, oh, we can help you there. So um, that, that's really what we're trying to do. That sounds a bit merciless, but you know, how do you make money out of security? It's one of those things that people expect, but don't really want to spend any money on, isn't it? Well, like a lot of things, but um, if we can give some confidence that we've moved this problem away from the business, then we consider it to be job done. And if we can make some money along the way, then we'll be very happy with that. <laughs> sure. The throughput of, of that board? Sorry. What's the throughput of the board? How many Did passwords can you check per second? Oh, um, the beta board at the moment, we're looking at about 100 authentications a second on our, on, on our beta board. This is the, the, the beta board that we have here. Um, um, about 100, verifications about 150 yeah. a second. That's per board. That, now, the, um, the board that we've got at the moment, uh, we, before we go to final production, we're going to put faster. We're running just an 80 megahertz processor. It sounds like that's nothing, but when all you're doing is shoving a bit of data and doing a compare, that's actually plenty of processing power. We haven't got to worry about plug and play events or anything like that. You know, this is raw processing power we've got there. But we're looking at f uh, four or 500 megahertz processors. We're also, the, the access to the data store at the moment is, um, because we're a startup, we can't afford to license the libraries that go with the some of the multimedia interfaces. So we're using a, a, single, um, in, a single bit interface to the memory card, but we'll be able to use a parallel interface, which will give us eight times better throughput. So there's a whole lot of optimizations that we will do to the board to make it run much faster um, that we haven't done to start with because we just, it, it's, a, it's a cost thing, to be yeah. honest, but we're very um, confident we, we can improve it. We should also form. say about data rates when we've talked to businesses, it's Verification, um, authentication checks are very infrequent. So um, the, if one business we talk to, uh, which has 30 million users, it's a retail, online retail business in this country, um, that um, it's a ticketing firm. And it basically has um, one authentication every two seconds when you average it out. The problem is, out when talking to customers, um, potential customers, is finding out what their burst rates are. And that's, usually they don't have data, and that is a bit of a problem. Um, write rates, again, tend to be very low, but we don't have burst rate data for write rates. Um, writes tend to be somewhat slower than read, um, than authentications. Um, and so that is a bit of a problem for us at the moment, and it's actually, um, working with beta customers at the moment to try and get data on what rates they actually work at. One thing I could just add, uh, going back to this point of um, how secure this thing really is. Um, one of the ways that we're looking of selling this and charging for it is um, we've had initial conversations with insurance companies. So you could effectively sell this as an insurance sell. So um, and it comes down to what are we willing to guarantee and what's the probability of there being a theft from this box versus another system. And one of the, uh, when this question comes up on the proof points, the way I normally challenge it is I say, well, if you, talk to the, if you talk to the guys that put your database system together that's running on that Linux system that you've got, will they ask them the question, will they guarantee you that the data can't be stolen? And, and they will say, well, of course not. They say, well, we will offer you a guarantee that the data can't be stolen over that connection to it. Now, the reason we would be willing to give that guarantee is that, yes, there are potentially, in theory, some ways that you could get the data out of this, but we believe it's so improbable, and the insurance companies we're talking to share that view that this is pretty secure. All of the normal attempts that you would, normal attacks that you would present to this box shouldn't work. Therefore, if I was going to give an insurance policy on data theft, I would insist that this box was installed there. And that's what we're trying to do with our discussions with insurance companies. So, 
So we would li literally sell it as a, you buy this thing and, in, and we'll indemnify you against that $160 per record. The insurance company would look at the, the, the risk of it and say, well, if it's in one of these boxes, that risk is massively reduced. Therefore, that. So that's kind of a way of us getting, it's a way of providing a guarantee, meaning, because what a guarantee actually doesn't mean 100%. A guarantee means if something goes wrong, what do you do for me? You know, you'll compensate me in some way. And we would feel confident that we could um, give a, a degree of guarantee that a system, another system that doesn't offer this hardware protection, wouldn't even want to go there. They couldn't begin to offer any guarantees there because so much of it is out of their control. It's not their operating system. It's not their hardware. Um, so that's a, an interesting angle that we're looking at. So how much is it how much should we charge for this? Oh, we, we're working that out at the moment as much as we possibly can, <laughs> <laughs> which means, um, well, when, what we have been doing is we've been talking to business. Our preferred method would be to charge for either the number of authentications or the number of records stored. That would be the preferred method. The customers that are shown the most interest in this at the moment are financial services organizations, mostly because they have the highest reporting requirements. They just have to report everything that happens around data theft. Their preference, unfortunately, at the moment is to purchase boxes. Um, and so, although, you know, when you're a startup, you'll take your money where you can. So I have no doubt that the first few sales that we will get will just be selling boxes for X thousand pounds of boxes, you know, per box. So we'll sell a system that'll come to a price and um, the alternative pricing we would prefer would be effectively to rent them a box or to charge for use. Because, um, and, and also I would say at the moment, um, most of the customers we're talking to prefer to have the boxes in their data centers. We would ideally like to produce a cloud version of this where you could have authentication, you know, ID as a service. Obviously that's gonna have a lot more challenges because of the public environment that it's in. You're, you're open immediately to DDoS attacks and all the other things that you don't get behind the firewall in the data center. So we realize that that's a different type of product. But that would ultimately be what we would like to do because obviously federated passwords and putting 500 million passwords all in one place is quite a big risk. And that's the way we're headed you know, with password federation. It's a big risk to put it all there. If you can, um, if you can be confident that those passwords can't be stolen though from that database, that's gotta be a, a useful thing. You know, that would reduce the liability. And so the, um, your, I mean, what is it, 1.2 billion passwords in your, you know, in, that Facebook are trying to protect there. If they felt that they could enhance the protection, it's got to be worth some money to them. Well, the another example, I mean, you can't, as we're at Microsoft, you have to mention Azure and, you know, the Microsoft business in storing other people's passwords. And, you know, the sort of, whatever the protection actually is around Azure, around that business at the moment, if, I'm not saying it will happen, but if at any point that Microsoft lose, say, an encrypted database of, part of usernames and passwords that it's storing for other people, that is going to be significant bad publicity for Microsoft and possibly impact the Azure business. I don't know what the Azure business is like at the moment. Um, but it's the kind of thing that actually becomes an issue mm. um, that one's got to think about. Actually, eBay is an interesting one that um, within a week or so, or I think it was within two weeks, a very short period of the uh, going public on the eBay uh, announcement, they, they issued a, a revenue warning to the markets of, of 200 million reduction just in the lack of transaction that's, that went on on eBay following the aftermath of the, the concerns about that. So this, I, I can kind of see how you get to this 4.6 million average cost. It, it's, it's, when you look at large global corporations that just have a little bit of dip. If you're, I mean, the Sony PlayStation one, which of course was the first one really that kicked this off, that system was offline for weeks. They, they believe the final bill is gonna be around $2 billion for that data theft, just that original attack on the Sony PlayStation network. It's, it's mind boggling amounts of money. So this is where, where they're sitting in the boardrooms looking at this, they're thinking if they can reduce the, their exposure to this problem, that's gonna be good enough. They're not overly concerned if it completely solves it as long as it just gets it out of their backyard and makes it someone else's problem. I know this, I keep apologizing, this, sound, this sounds terrible, but th that's the fact. It, and if we, can, if we can help them, help convince them that it's gonna be more secure doing it this way, then um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll make a living out of it. But the jury's out on that at the moment, I'm afraid. <laughs> Let's hope. Uses for, you know, this kind of, I cannot read my data thing. Because I'd say that, 
you know, stealing credit cards is also pretty important, but, you know, you have to read them somehow. Um, so do you have other uses for this kind of things rather than just passwords? Back yeah. to the roadmap. Yes, yeah, so um, I think we've got, if I can just quickly knit back to this, yeah, this slide. Yeah, there's another, uh, we, we, we do see a whole kind of potential roadmap of products so based on this no read idea and a modification around no, no read. So another one is um, the idea of no change. So if you have a, effectively think of a syslog server that you can write data to, but it can't be changed. Effectively a, a dynamic CD-ROM, effectively, you know, you, you can write data to this box. This, in this particular case, you might allow people to read data out, but you could never allow them to modify it. So it would be effectively a no-change server using similar techniques where you know what data goes in, but you can't allow them to go in and tamper with the results. That was suggested. Uh, it was actually a, a UK bank that suggested that to us because they're saying that one of the problems they have during data thefts is that the, uh, the kind of hackers that they're dealing with, they come in, disarm the intrusion system so that there's no logging that's going on or attempt to steal the data and then put the system back again. You know, true kind of Mission Impossible type stuff. It sounds, sounds unlikely, but that, that's the kind of thing they're telling us. So he liked the idea of, of, of a tamper-proof um, server, and that's a, that's a variation on this. The credit card one is interesting because the data does need to leave the box, but this notion of having the, the public <coughs> interface where the credit card details would come in and be stored through, through this non-return valve, if you like, you, you can't get the credit card details back out of there. But you can then have a private connection to the clearing bank using all of your normal clever encryption to make it less likely that that transaction, that that, that data is going to be stolen from the back end there. But the public interface coming in, you wouldn't be able to get the credit cards back out the way they went in. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so we, we do see variants on this. Okay. I think we're just about out of time. Let's yeah. take the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, just in case you want to contact us at all with any follow-up questions, um, there are email details, and you can always follow us on Twitter if you're at all interested.